Hi there, beautiful people. My name is Chris Jones, and I'm going to be talking to you today for Meet the Scientists on COP26.tv. I'm going to be talking with Professor Patricia Harvey, um, Head of Aquatic Biotechnology and Biology with a focus on food, cosmetics, biofuels, and pharmaceuticals. So, um, welcome, um, Patricia. How are you doing today? Good. I've uh, just come hot foot from another meeting where we've been looking at algae. Um, as a food and uh, what we can do with regard to cultivating algae um, because we do need to feed another um, huge surge in people by 2050 and we need to increase our food supplies by about 50 percent and where are we going to go? We need to go and start looking at water which covers 70 percent of the earth um, and about 97 percent is ocean so what can we do with regard to getting um, use of the ocean sustainably and healthily. So that so, so that's kind of like a, a sort of overview summary of your uh, your focus and your research at the moment. Is that fair to say? I would I would say yes. Um, I seem to be um, talking in lots of different directions about algae simply because we know so little about the uh, resource base of algae. Um, on the one hand, they've got very high value. So I spoke last week to the European Algal Biomass Association about the high value compounds that we can get out of algae. Um, and as I say to Food and Drink Association today about the potential for food and cultivating algae. How can we grow them as an alternative agriculture to feed people? Mm. And and so like so why why um, is algae so important and obviously why why have you chosen that as your as your focus of your research? Okay, um, one of the really important points about um, algae they're plants. They um, consume carbon dioxide and they use light and they um, are huge catalysts to be able to provide the energy in the form of food that we need or in terms of the fuel that we enable us to do things. Um, and uh, we could be looking at plants from land, but there's a real concern about being able to uh, utilize um, our resources sustainably. If we keep on putting pressure on land resources, uh, we'll mess up the biodiversity that we've got. We, we need to be able to um, uh, utilize um, our land more efficiently in order to be able to feed more people. Um, and um, if we don't, we'll, we'll, we'll really have some big concerns about biodiversity. Also, we put pressure on water use and we will start to run out of phosphate. If we start to look at water and the oceans, potentially we've got um, a, a big opportunity to meet some of the requirements that we've got using the plants. But at the moment, what we're still doing with the oceans is eating the um, carnivals, the top, the lions and the tigers equivalent from the ocean, we need to start eating the plants. And so what I'm really interested in is um, the potential of being able to harness the vegetables from the salty water, not least because we can consume carbon dioxide and number two, we can use non-potable salty water that we can't drink. And water is going to be another big hot topic going forward. Can um, I just ask, and, um, uh, you use the term there, potable. Um, so so what, what, does that, what does that mean? in general when you're saying about Sorry, possible, the, what, possible water oh um the um sorry can you i, I don't understand what you're you, you mentioned the term potable uh oh potable non-potable water non-drinking non-drinkable water we were able to um grow algae on water that we couldn't drink it's salty um and that we can't use to plant land-based crops but actually the ocean has got salt water and it's got crops, plants that have been adapted to grow in that salt water. So if we can work out how to get into that ocean uh, treasure trove and uh, utilize it in a sustainable way, then we have got a huge potential resource. But the trouble is that for centuries, um, people have been um, working on the land and not on the water. Mm. Um, and we need to now go back to look at the the vegetables of the ocean instead of just the fish otherwise we will land up with the problem of overfishing on water which we were already facing quite starkly so the 
So I'm really interested in looking at how we can grow um, algae to consume carbon dioxide and at the same time provide all of the natural products, the chemicals, the um, food that we need to feed a growing population. So I'm very interested in, uh, there's, there's a couple of different um, strands that I definitely want to talk about. Um, obviously, focusing on on COP, we're, we're really interested in the kind of CO2 production and obviously then and then food, you know, which is, you know, as our global population goes towards the sort of 10 billion mark, which we're, we're getting towards fairly, fairly rapidly. Um, we're we're going to need to use other areas of, of the planet surface in order to to generate food. Um, and to, so what, what can you tell me with regard to algae and, and CO2 capture? You know, what, what, what sort of okay. how does it operate? Well, it was with, with regard to um, algae, there really are simply like our land-based plants. The alga that I'm working on um, consumes, well, for every, uh, you know, for every 100 tonnes of biomass, uh, we can consume about 425 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Um, and and, and the, the alga, depending on the type of alga that you're using as the catalyst, will make different kinds of products, different kinds of uh, molecules. The alga that I'm working on um, produces a very uh, important um, portfolio of carotenoids. These are carotenes, a bit like carrot. Mm. But one of them is very, very unique. Um, and we've been working with a number of different partners across Europe to be able to understand how best to produce large amounts of this because we've got good evidence that this particular carotenoid, carotene isomer, is incredibly valuable. If you're suffering from psoriasis, it'll help to treat psoriasis, help to treat atherosclerosis. It'll also help if you've got um, eye disease, various different types of eye disease, to be able to help with uh, preventing or curing some of these eye diseases. And it's also recently been shown to have some important brain function properties as well. The alga that we're working on, which causes bright pink lakes all around the globe um, in salt water, very high salty water, produces up to 14% of its biomass as this beta carotene. It's one of the richest sources of beta carotene that we've got, that we know about. Um, so I'm particularly interested in understanding how we can get high density, good quality biomass from these tiny little cells. And the cells are about 10 to 20 microns in size. Um, we have to harvest them out of the water and then process them to get the, the uh, chemicals out. It's a much, much, much more effective way than chemically making the compounds. So a micron, we're sort of talking about the sort of size of th thinner than a human hair, you know, so a human hair is maybe... Can't high see high them. Degrees. You cannot see yeah. them except with a microscope. Really small, tiny, 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 tiny cells. Um, and so you, you really cannot see them, but they do contribute a very nice pink color to all of the tubes and photobioreactors and lakes that we've got around us. So um, you probably, uh, you're still recording me, but I, you probably can't see my video behind me, an image of um, a bright pink lake. Yeah, so yeah, I can see that. Is, is that is that something to do with um, flamingos and uh, their, their coloring or is that something, something different? It certainly is. Um, um, the flamingos feed on the shrimps that grow in the pink waters, and they feed on the algae. So there's a chain. Um, but we wouldn't dream of eating the pink flamingos. Um, and by the same token, we increasingly need to start understanding how to eat the shrimps and um, to consume the algae that the shrimps uh, feed on. Uh, not least because that's going to be a much more energy um, sustainable route. Um, by which to be able to live um, in a in a, a station, stable, sustainable ecosystem. Mm. So w we've mentioned about sort of like the CO two production, and we've sort of touched on on the food. Um, you, you know, so the, the the particular type of algae that you're looking at has has a range. Is it a, a range of different colours? So it's the same kind of family, yeah. but but you know you've got different All right. set of colours. I'll tell you a little bit about. A little yeah. bit about algae. They're actually, we're working on two different types of um, algae. Um, we've got these microalgae, which are very tiny little cells. Dunnelliella salina, the salty, salt-loving algae that I mentioned. 
But we're also working on seaweed, which also grow um, in salt sea water, and they can grow very, very long, 70 meters long. Um, both of them have got um, pretty good quality protein, um, and we need that protein. So they, in both, both cases, the tiny little cells and also the very big seaweeds, the challenge that we face is how to make those um, cells or seaweed plants um, available and accessible to people so that they can start to try them, eat them, and realize their value for, for health. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, it, um, you talked about like, so obviously um, some of these algae are producing chemicals that are, you know, the, the, the shrimp are taking up and they're giving them their colors. Uh, are there any other sort of colors, uh, any other sort of chemicals or pharmaceuticals that, that this, this particular type of algae or your research has, has seen? Or um... There are, there are a, a huge number of different types of compounds that people are looking at um, in different algae. I mean, let's take seaweeds, for example. The, um, in, in Southeast Asia, people have been eating seaweed for a very long time. They know that um, they contribute health benefits. Not exactly sure the reasons why all the time, but we know that they do. And um, so fast forward to now, there's a massive amount of work looking at the phytosterols, the, the phenolics, the um, uh, uh, prebiotic functions of these seaweeds, um, the uh, different kinds of um, compounds, bioactive peptides, that might be able to help us with um, various disease states that people suffer from. Um, and I, I think one of the really important things is to, to be able to produce sufficient quantities of these compounds and to get them eventually into human trials so that we can pass the legislation to show the benefits of these different um, uh, attributes that algae have um, so that we can start really uh, labeling them um, as health, health benefiting uh, compounds, health benefiting um, natural products. Until we do that, we really can't say very much about them except to get the work, get the data and try to persuade people um, to support the, the effort so that we can stop producing um, chemicals based on fossil, fossil sources and start producing compounds that help us but from natural renewable uh, mm. resource bases.